Hello everyone. In this video I'd like to talk a little bit about a healthy and happy left hand technique for the violist. Um, as we discussed in the previous uh, video on posture and setup, every violist has a different anatomy and every viola is actually a different size. I mean if we had the anatomically perfect viola that worked with all of its proportions, well, I, for one, would have my arms stretched out and I'd probably get to third position. <laughs> um, so I have a slightly smaller instrument. But anyway, the point is, this is not a violin. And I know many of us, myself included, came to the viola a little bit later in life after having quite a long and happy and somewhat screechy life as a violinist. Um, and then we went to the dark side, discovered the love of the C string. And anyway, I, I would love to help people to avoid what I suffered a few years into my transition, which was a rather severe case of tendonitis in my left hand, because I didn't really, I was so passionate about playing that, and I was also a teenager, and when you're a teenager, you don't necessarily think clearly, and you're getting to know your body in its new way. And anyway, I put a lot of undue stress on my left hand, and I'd like to just offer some ideas that came from working through injury and rehabbing it and discovering how our alto voice, our instrument that's actually between the violin and the cello, depending on your anatomy and on the size of the viola and actually upon what you're playing, how you navigate really as a violist. And so your violin technique isn't necessarily going to get you 100% to where you want to go as a violist. Um, if you have small hands, the actual distances to be healthy can't be navigated in the same way. And actually your vibrato is affected. I mean, we all think about the speed difference in vibrato between a violin and a viola, but I think how you access that is also important. We have, I have three assistants today, and maybe let's do without violas first. So come on in, guys. <laughs> So this is Sergio and Halam and Taylor. And as you can see, we're all rather different. Let's hold up our hands so everyone can see how different our hands look too in terms of size. So I just have a couple of warm ups I always suggest to people. In our previous video on posture, we warmed up how we're standing. So we'll pretend that you've already done that and just explore a little bit from the left side with some more specificity now that we know what the bones look like, what it actually can feel like. So the first thing I want you to do is just kind of swing your arm and just really get that shoulder loosened up. And then I want everyone to beg like a puppy dog and see what happens if you just flop. Okay, everything, like you, you got a shoulder, you got a humerus, radius, an ulna. I'm not even gonna try to name all the little bones in your hand because <laughs> there are a lot of them. <laughs> Somebody else can do that. Okay, and so let it rest again, just swing it. And wouldn't it be nice if we could all play the cello and it's right here, right? But we don't. We have to play over here. So we want to find out again with this nice, open, free-flowing breath in our chest, keeping that open, feeling how that works. Just sort of check and see. Everybody has a slightly different turnout in the shoulder joint. You want to keep that connected, but you want it to feel free. Okay, now let's go back to our puppy dog begging. And now let's go back to, I'm going to offer you something. Okay, because when we're playing, we're feeling generous, so we want to give. And now just extend that giving. Depends how long your fingerboard is, how, how much of an extension you need. And it depends how long your arm is, too. Sergio can just hang out. Halam and Taylor and I need to be a little bit more generous with our giving <laughs> to feel this, right? And to do that, again, you really want to make sure that your core is underneath you and that you are feeling an expansion from your big muscles here that are strong. And so I think it's really important to feel that this support happens in your oblique muscles and that you're able to give from a generous center so that you're feeling from the strongest part of yourself, you're extending out. So what did you guys notice about the angle of your hand when you went from begging puppy dog to generosity? Was anyone trying to be generous by taking at the same time? <laughs> right? We don't want to be giving and taking it in a traffic jam with ourselves. So we want to start with a feeling of generosity this way. And I think also, depending what your joint situation is, I'm a little bit hypermobile here, so I have even more give that way. I'm going to call this the back end of your vibrato, because if you're a violist, you have to have a really juicy vibrato, okay? So this is where, um, and maybe I'll get my fingerboard to show. Okay, so, I was taught, okay, I'm going to put my first finger down, I'm going to put all my fingers down in relationship to it. And here's my hand. Okay, this is my knuckle line. If I put my fourth finger down, here's my E, 
And if I put my fourth finger down expecting an A, I'm out of luck. That's as far as I get with my hand feeling centered going to my fourth finger. Sergio, could you show us first position from your perspective? <laughs> With the yeah, adjustment just see how or... Yeah, Okay, you still get there, right? Well, a little low, but... <laughs> right, because his knuckle line, obviously, is bigger. He can encompass more. So, you don't see a cellist. I'm sorry we don't have a cellist here to show you. Playing the fourth finger in first position with the first finger locked back. So, you have to think of this if you have a smaller hand. It is its own animal. But it's maybe psychologically important to remember that you can be a cellist in the middle voice <laughs> and you have to kind of crawl up the fingerboard. So I'm gonna invite everybody to come over to the piano and we're gonna warm up a few specific aspects of the left hand that can be helpful. Halam and Taylor and Sergio and I are here and we're just gonna explore how if we were playing the piano or some normal instrument where our hand has access to gravity, what that would look like. And I'd just like to sort of warm up a few different things and aspects of your left hand. It's important to know how they work, and then it's gonna be a fluid interchange of each of these events as you play beautifully. So let's just walk our pads in a little bit and out. Just kind of warm that up and feel. I'm sure many of you have been told, play on the pads of your fingers and not on the tip. So see what happens if you play on the tippy tip, right? There's a little bit of nail in there. Again, a viola string's a little bit thicker. We have more juice to pull out. So we want to kind of go for the pads, okay? And then there's something here right about your fortune teller line that we call in viola speak in Tuttle land, the bass knuckles. And so we want to be thinking of articulating from these bass knuckles. So you're not going to put fingers down like fish on a dock flopping here where there's no power. But you want to feel, again, from this place here that you can play. Okay, and again, we're gonna just relax and take a nap on the piano so we get used to just feeling really, really loose here and relax, okay? And maybe you can even hear on the video, that actually makes noise in and of itself and nobody feels stressed, right? Okay, does everybody notice that when we use the bass knuckles from here, the thumb's not playing, the wrist isn't flopping around, and the neck's not squeezing? Very often <laughs> people get a full body articulation going on, and it usually slows you down and after a while causes pain. So if you can figure out who does what job and let that part of your person do his or her job, you'll just be better off and you'll be more comfortable. So we're gonna plop from the base knuckles. Karen Tuttle's term was plop each finger down and each finger having its own weight and balance. And as we saw from Claire's bone demonstration, roughly speaking, your support system for your ring finger and your pinky is gonna be that ulna. And the index finger and the second finger, they get the radius with all of his or her mobility, <laughs> okay? But the thumb really is a neutral party, okay? So for fast playing, for power, for articulation, you need gravity from your base knuckles and you need to plop. You don't wanna be squeezing with the thumb, you don't wanna be flopping around and unstable with your wrist, and you don't wanna be squeezing with your neck when you play. And then the next part of what I think is really important for navigation is cultivating a really communicative, expressive relationship of flexibility with your knuckles. So I call this the inchworm. <laughs> so we're gonna curtsy from our base knuckles and just see what happens to each one of these joints as we do it. And then we're gonna open. And then we're gonna round. And we're just, you don't wanna overdo this, but you wanna explore, oh, this is yummy. And then we can start to crawl. Right. <laughs> so we have a lot of inchworms here. So you got your plop and your crawl. And then you're going to have a basic roll that's going to happen. And again, when we were just doing our begging puppy dog demo, just to feel if we don't interfere and overthink, where does, if we're going to come out here, where does gravity put us? And so the vibrato, you'll start from base knuckle to finger pad with a nice neutral wrist, and you'll plop and you'll roll. So I think it's very helpful um, to cultivate and learn how to do a wrist and a finger vibrato. Um, doesn't mean your arm's never gonna move, and I'll get my viola and show you a demo of why maybe moving more here is gonna get you more juice in your vibrato. But anyway, these are just some warm-ups you can do. I have one more I'd like you to look at, you guys. If you just kind of gently drop your hand down on your pinky side, 
on your ulna, now that we all know what it's called. And everybody look at where their thumb is if they don't think about it. And now stick your thumb behind your index finger joint. And what, do you, what does anybody notice? Just very tense. Tense. Yeah, okay, <laughs> so we just want to relax that. And then if we go this way, where does it go? And if we go this way, where does it go? <laughs> and then we gradually talk ourselves into this rather ridiculous position in which we find ourselves for hours a day. But we have to feel gravity. We have to feel support. Fingers drop. Ne thumbs are neutral. And they really are, I think of the thumb as the, perhaps as, she's the ambassador of the radius. She hangs out with wherever that radius happens to need to go. And that's, again, depending on, let's see, hold up your left hand here. Okay, I want you to look at the difference in pinky relationships here versus stub doesn't even come up to here. So if I'm gonna play on my pinky, I have to make a big adjustment. So let's get our violas. Okay, so you saw our little warm up for finger action and inchworm motion on the piano on the flat surface. And I'll show you a little bit how that can work to really free up your left hand and help it to feel more organized, flexible, but at the same time really strong on the left hand. Um, I actually, I, I think I'll show you this way. You want to make sure that the carpal tunnel here is free. So I know many of us learned, and again, when the violin fingerboard was smaller and we could fit a position for most of us between here and here, and it felt good that way. Again, when we're dealing with a longer string length and we want to be able to have elasticity and power for each finger, you want to make sure, again, that you don't go to the fourth finger, which is the shortest finger, by pulling away from the viola because then as you see the movements restricted, it also puts a tremendous amount of tension on your wrist when you do this. You wanna to try to find where again, if you didn't work hard and you were looking for the body's wisdom of balance on its own, that you would feel, again, playing with that. If I wanna to go to my fourth finger, I really wanna feel my ulna underneath that fourth finger, and then I wanna be able to drop from the base knuckle and my wrist and my thumb are hanging out for the party, but they're not throwing the party. They're neutral bystanders. So we're gonna feel for that, for me to find an A, I have to feel on the D string. I come up to meet myself. I find where, again, depends how long this is. I have a little hook for my thumb and I drop. And then I can feel that. And then my third finger wants to have its support also roughly from the ulna right underneath it. It's gonna drop from the base knuckles. Then I'm gonna drop my second finger and that's where I'm a little bit of a relay racer. I'm gonna pass that through here. So four, three, two, one. I'm gonna drop my first finger and that has the radius underneath it and it feels comfy. And my wrist is neutral and stable. And then I come back to two and then I release my base knuckles. And this is where, for me, because my hand is smaller, I wanna feel plop and a little bit of crawl and plop and a little crawl and plop and crawl. And my thumb is really just loose, always hanging out with the radius. And since I really wanna have a really good support system and independence for each finger to feel articulation, I'm gonna roll through a little bit to go back and forth. But my hand, if I look at it from the outside, my arm and hand, they maintain a consistent relationship. But underneath it all, it's really always moving. So it's like, it's a perspective issue, I think. When you are at the Grand Canyon and you're at the rim and you're looking down at the Colorado River, it looks like a strip, a solid strip. And so from the outside, my hand and arm are gonna look like a solid organized strip. From the inside, if you walk down to the, or you ride a donkey down to the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you're gonna see the water is moving all the time and there's different current and there's different force so from the inside it's a constant state of motion and rebalancing that i want to feel it's very active um, and it feels good but i basically i have first position i hear it first the most important thing to do of course is listen you always want to listen but listening can also involve listening to your body and how it feels so you're listening for a pitch you're listening for that vibration of the pitch in your body in your viola and you meet very happily and beautifully in tune if you don't interfere right here on your fingerboard. So I would like for maybe each one of you guys to show how first position on the D string looks for you when you're comfortable. So Halam's gonna go first. She's also kind of tiny like me. Do you wanna show them what you used to do? 
That might oh. be helpful to see. Right, so you see all that tension and contortion to get to the fourth finger. Now try to vibrate from there. With the bow? If you want. Right, so that, that'll do for a little shimmer color, right? Show them how you can do it now. Go to town. Right, so by supporting here and releasing, she can actually move through the entire pad of the finger. And that's what we want to hear. If you just want a little shimmery, excited, vibrato, you can, your, your tip's going to get you a, a nice sound, but we want options. So we want to make sure we can really, yeah, look at that, all that big movement that she can have. So Taylor, why don't you show us what it looks like for you? Do you want to show a before picture? Yeah, it's probably something <laughs> like a long. Just, I don't know. <laughs> right, and I seem to recall you couldn't even vibrate the fourth finger at all from where you were. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I have to bring my thumb forward quite a bit. Right, but you're not thinking, move my thumb, you're just really releasing from the bass knuckle and your hand is loose and the family stays together mm -hmm. in a really elastic way. Good, now go back to your first finger and feel what that means for you. And just open up your hand a little bit, find where that's comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you might want to open a little bit, but you don't open by pulling the wrist back. You open by keeping space in your hand. I like to think of holding an avocado or a water bottle or something. You keep that nice space, but you don't confuse it with this having a space in first through third positions. Obviously, when we go up here, this is where we are, but the principles of balance and connection will still apply. Okay, Sergio, why don't you show us what it means for you? <laughs> so the before and after also? If you'd like. So before, I could still reach the the fourth, but my hand would be locked there and I couldn't vibrate. Mm -hmm. So the pinky is still not in an ideal position, but now I can do this. <laughs> you want to vibrate your fourth finger? Right, again, that just gives you options. So we're all about options here. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, you'll notice that just to sort of synthesize what we talked about on the piano. You're going to feel your articulation from your bass knuckles. You're going to have a neutral wrist. I'm sure many of you have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome, where people who sit at computers all day like this, that gets really injured and stressed. We do not want that to happen to us because we want to be able to play for many hours and be happy and healthy and have long lives as violas. We also want to play in tune. Playing in tune is a moral obligation. And you'll find that if you work with the support system and the natural flexibility of your body and your natural balance, you're also going to play more in tune. Um, so I just want to show you a few things about vibrato that can be helpful with the rolling perspective. So I think it's always helpful to start just kind of, let's, you know, like when you learn to ride a bike, you use training wheels first. So we're going to start with a little bit of support on the shoulder of the viola and just wave and really open up that motion because, again, one of the bigger differences between violin and viola is you actually need more amplitude in your vibrato. You need it to be bigger because the string length is bigger, right? Um, you also need, just because the strings are thicker, just a teeny bit more power and bounce, or I don't like to use the word force, but you get the idea <laughs> to put the finger down. We don't need as much as our poor bass playing colleagues need, but we need more than the violinists do to put the fingers down. Um, that being said, I think you'll notice when you start to examine this that perhaps you're using more force than you need to. So you can practice with harmonics just nicely and lightly there. But with the vibrato, you can start by warming this up, really, if you've never used a wrist vibrato before, just opening back here and really feeling what that is. I find for some people, putting the viola here like a guitar is also a nice middle step where you can sort of just hang and wave from that hanging and waving perspective. And then you can plop from your bass knuckle and you feel the pitch and then you're gonna rock through the pad and it's gonna be juicy. And then you're gonna rock your way back up. So I think slow motion exercise is really feeling rolling through the whole pad of the finger. And as we discovered on the piano, letting each of these joints be part of the family and move as a unit and having that be organized. And it's kind of, you'll see it's, it's on a diagonal and you really want it all to be free. So I like to start with the second finger sort of in guitar position to feel that and then you can roll that back and just feel your, your um, area there and just a slightly bigger thing. And you wanna make sure you're not pressing so hard that inhibits your movement or stops the string too much. 
Um, and then if you want to take your training wheels further, so you can start, I think the second finger being the biggest and the strongest, it's always good to start here. And then you can give yourself training wheels this way, just support yourself to make sure you keep the same shape in your hand and that your wrist again is supported and open and you can come back and you can vibrate here because that's again, if we're just, if we're feeling that wrist stress here, we get a little shimmer perhaps in our first finger, but we don't get the full Monty here, which gives us our juicy, our juicy sound. Um, so that's kind of a, again, I feel like I should do a medical disclaimer. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't want to be telling you this is something you can just change overnight. It's a process and it's something that takes time to develop. But if you want to get more comfortable and you want to really play in tune and have a juicy vibrato, you have options. So um, Karen Tuttle used to sit in lessons. I'm just going to show you the inchworm again, which you saw on the piano. And she would put her first finger on the C string, second on the G, third on the D, fourth on the A, and she would sit there and listen to us. And she would crawl up the viola and down the viola, just really cultivating a sense of that tactile loving sensation it just tastes good on your viola but the other thing that does is again and depending on the size of your hand the expression that you want to make when you're balancing from one to four you're gonna feel I articulate I bounce from the bass knuckle I get my human inchworm going on and I crawl to the fourth finger and the whole family's there and I don't go on a detour out and around and come through it's all really right here. And you'll find that the inchworm technique can really be your fluid bridge, you know, for expression, but also for navigation, that your knuckles are really flexible, your frame is secure so you know where everything is, and it keeps it really together. And then when you're playing in higher positions, and maybe Sergio, you should come back here for this, um, because he has, he's my biggest demo for the biggest hand in the <laughs> class right now. So when I go up the A string and I'm playing way up here and I have to play passage work, I have a kind of a thumb position that I need. I want to keep my forearm, my bass knuckles and my pads well organized, but I have a shoulder to navigate now. And depending on if I want to vibrate here, I'm going to be a little further out. If I want to play passage work, I'm going to have viola thumb position. Now, where do you have your moment where you have to turn around here? Okay, and if you want to vibrate juicily up there, just where do you put, okay. So if you wanted to put the pad more on it, would you come around here a little bit more sometimes? The pad. The pad of the finger. If oh. you want a really juicy vibrato, I think that's different when you're playing high oh, yeah. than if you put pad, right. So you can make that fluid adjustment, but as you're navigating the bouts of the viola, again, everybody's viola bouts are a different size. That's the beauty of our instrument is that every single one is different unless somebody made a pattern and. I don't know, 3D violas printed them out so they're identical. <laughs> but each one of us has different bouts to navigate and how we do that depends on what kind of sound we're making, whether we're doing passage work here, in which case I like to feel, again, my forearm, my bass knuckles, my pads, and I have a little hook here with my thumb. And again, if I want some juice in my sound, I have to find that compromise for the bout where I can move each of these joints. And of course, my arm is a little more involved when I'm up here. But this is moving, this is moving. And then if I'm switching to fast passage work, I do that again. If I need to vibrate, I have to find the balance. And since my fingers are kind of short, I'm in thumb position perhaps sooner than Sergio is here. You know, so find what that is for you. But again, the principles are really, really active, ploppy bass knuckles. Marvelous flexibility with each of the four basic joints, wrist first to here, and then you can have shimmer in your first finger joint for, with your vibrato, and then if you really want to go to town, you open the whole thing back and you feel that through. So there's lots to explore with that freedom there, but hopefully these exercises give you an idea of some things you can do. And you're always navigating just as we are with the torso from the center out in the microcosm of your left hand from the center out, and you're always supporting feeling the middle and the strong things. And I just like to say in life, it's important to support the little guy so you have to if you want your fourth finger to vibrate and we all do you want to support it and water it and nourish it so it can do its best work right okay yes. good so to summarize again just as with everything we've talked about so far you want to be comfortable you want to allow the body's natural wisdom to be your guide you want to articulate from your base knuckles so you want to plop your finger action. You don't want to squeeze your thumb 
You want to have a nice neutral thumb. You don't want to have the hokey pokey going on with your wrist or the squeezy squeezy with your neck. You keep all that open and you're very clear and you navigate however you need to hear what you're about to play and you feel that really independence and gravity and power for each finger, but power and focus without tension. And I think you'll find that your left hand feels better and functions better. The beauty of this is if you allow yourself to move well and be comfortable and organized, you're going to play more in tune and you're going to have a really juicy vibrato. I think it's going to make your life better. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy.